morning, we just uh, thank you for your presence in our midst today. We thank you for exciting things that you're doing. We thank you for the opportunity to bless the children in our church and our community by pouring into them this summer, giving them a fun week, but a week filled with the truth of your word. We thank you that we can come and absorb the truth of your word this morning. We just ask you to quicken it to our spirit and quicken our spirit to receive it. And Father, we just thank you today for the, the living word, Jesus Christ, who, who gives us uh, our very breath and very life, who created all things, and in all things, he holds it together. And we just thank you for this today as we press into this portion of your scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we took a couple of weeks to explore the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Colossian church. And I want to stop before we enter into chapter 2 and summarize four of the key points that Paul has already told us in this first chapter that he wrote to the Colossian church. The first thing would be this, that the Christian life requires sacrifice, but it is worth it. The second thing is this, that we need to understand the mystery that was once hidden but is now revealed. That mystery is simply this, Christ in you is the hope of glory. The third thing we need to know that Paul had stressed is we need to know what we believe so we won't be misled. And the fourth thing is it's not enough to know what we believe, we need to live what we believe. So here, as we enter into chapter 2, we're going to actually see the Apostle Paul re-emphasizing now each of these points as he moves through this letter and putting additional emphasis on it. It's like he said to them, these are the things I need you to know. Now he's going to go back and say, do you understand what I'm telling you here? Do you understand? Because he, he, he's got a, a goal in mind that when they get done reading this letter, they'll have captured a certain amount of this truth and be able to apply it. So the, the, the first thing Paul does is he starts to reiterate these same points in chapter 2, starting with verse 1, where he says this, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face. This is a reminder of what Paul just said at the end of chapter 1, where he said, I rejoice in my suffering for your sake. He was talking about the, the sacrifice of Christian fellowship, how we as the body of Christ participate in Christ's sufferings. And so he told them, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And now he says, I want you to know how great a struggle I have. How great a struggle I've experienced on your behalf. And he says an interesting thing. He says, on behalf of all those who have not personally seen my face. Now that makes an interesting contrast between this letter and the letter we studied before, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Because they're so similar, and even today we'll contrast some of the verses between Colossians and Ephesians, but there was really one distinct difference between the church at Ephesus and this church at Colossae. The fact is that Paul had established personally the church at Ephesus. And he knew them very well, he'd lived there with them. But the church at Colossae, Paul had never been there. Paul hadn't started the church in Colossae. Uh, one of Paul's disciples, a man he trained up, a man whose name was Epaphras, he had started a church in Colossae. Now, what we're reading here came about because of this. Epaphras starts a church. Well, guess what? Sometimes churches have problems. And Epaphras was not as experienced as Paul, so when, when the church at Colossae started to have problems, and the problems we are identified here, false teachings were coming into the Colossian church. So Epaphras left Colossae and went to Rome, where Paul was in prison, and said, look, we got problems back at that church. I, I don't know what to do. And so Paul said, I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to write them a letter using my authority 
to correct the problems there. That's what this letter is. It's the letter that Paul was sending back to the Colossians in light of the problems that, that Epaphras had told him about there. But other than Epaphras and maybe a few others that Paul had personally trained, he didn't know the people there that he was writing the letter to. They had never seen his face. They knew him by reputation, maybe. So the fact that he didn't know them, he's saying, that doesn't mean I don't care about you. That doesn't mean I don't pray for you. In fact, he says, I want you to know how much I struggle for you in prayer. How much I, I wage spiritual warfare for you over the, the problems that are happening in your church. He uses a word that we translate in English as struggle. It's a Greek word and it's simply this, agona. And agona is where the word agony comes from. Paul says, I'm in agony struggling for you in intercession. It, it's tearing me up hearing what's going on in your church. And I am just pouring myself into my prayer over you. This is the same word that is used when we saw Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke 22, 44, and it says, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. Well, that's the same level of prayer that Paul was pouring out for the Colossians. He said, I'm in agony when I think about these false teachers coming in there. I just pray against this spiritual darkness. And that's what we know that our real battle is. It's not against flesh and blood. It's against spiritual darkness. And Paul knew that the spiritual darkness that was trying to settle in on the Colossian church was real. And he was wrestling. He was agonizing for those churches through the power of prayer. And in verse 2 and 3, he explains some of the things that he's praying for them. He's saying that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, once again, there's a lot of similarity to what Paul says he's praying for them to what he said he was praying for the Ephesian church, the people he knew personally. In Ephesians 3, he said this. He was praying that, that God would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, what is the length, what is the height, what is the depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. I think it's significant for us to understand there's two different churches, two different groups of people. Apostle Paul's praying very similar things for them. That's no coincidence. I think it's because that's what we need prayer for. We need prayer for understanding. We need prayer for comprehension. We need prayer for knowledge. So let's take this then as, as something for ourselves. When we pray for each other, pray for those things. When you pray for me, pray for me to have understanding and knowledge and comprehension because I can't come up here and bring forth the word unless God gives me that. Do you understand? And when I pray for you, that's what I'm going to be praying. That when you open up your Bible, the first thing I'm going to pray is that you will open up your Bible. And then I will pray that when you open up your Bible, you will have knowledge, you will have comprehension, you will have understanding. And Paul says this, true knowledge is Christ himself. If you're, if you're looking at the word and you're not getting Christ out of the word, you're not getting the true knowledge. You're missing what it is about. Because the Bible is about Jesus. All of it. He's the central figure of everything that happens from the Old Testament through the new. And this is important. This is so important because why was Paul saying this to the Colossian church? Because the false teachers.
teachers that were coming into the Colossian church were trying to de-emphasize Jesus. They were trying to put him in a little corner. Yeah, 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 get saved. That's cool. Believe in Jesus, yeah. But then go for the real deep stuff over here. And the, according to them, the deep stuff had nothing to do with Jesus. Jesus was like, oh, he's for beginners. He's like the starting point. But then you go into the deep stuff. And Paul's saying, Jesus is the deep stuff. There's nothing deeper than Jesus. There's no knowledge that you could possibly have that is better than knowing Jesus. And this is what he says to them in verse 4. I say this so that no one will delude you with persuasive argument. He knows exactly what's going on from what Epaphras has told him about this Colossian church. And here, Paul is struggling in prayer. He's praying, I want you to get the true knowledge and the true understanding because I know there are people there right in your midst that are trying to delude you. They're, and they're persuasive. They make a lot of case for this secret knowledge. They make it seem enticing. Right, amen. Like... What, I, after Jesus, there's more? No! Jesus is it, and there's more of Jesus, but there's not something beyond Jesus that you're going to get. But they were persuasive. They were Gnostics. Remember we talked about that? The word Gnostic comes from knowledge, and they said, we've got the secret knowledge. The secret knowledge, which is better than Jesus. No. It's delusion. And Paul was exerting himself so much because he couldn't be there in person. He says in verse 5, so, For even though I am absent in body, nevertheless I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ. Now the false teachers were right there. Right there. Paul was miles away in Rome, in prison. And the only thing he could do was pray and write. And so he's writing fervently, this is what you need to do to fight back against this false teaching. And he gives them three key elements that we need to focus on. He says, one, be in the spirit. In the spirit you can win this battle, he's saying. Two, good discipline. He says, I rejoice when I hear about your discipline in your faith. That's important. And the third thing is stability. Stability in your faith. Now, let me ask you something. Do these same strategies matter to us today? Absolutely. Let me tell you something. When you look at this particular uh, uh, thing that was going on in the Colossian church, sometimes you say, oh yeah, Pastor Steve was teaching us a history lesson. <laughs> about the Gnostics, spelled with a G. But that was way back then. No, it's not. It's now. It's the same form of error that continues to try to knock down who Jesus is in our world today. It's pervasive. It has never stopped. Paul was fighting in the Colossian church, but eventually it was attacking every one of the churches, and it attacks Praise Tabernacle. Why? Because people don't want to submit to Jesus Christ. So they're looking for another way. And our society is only too happy to oblige those who are looking for another way. And in recent years, we had a, a, a best-selling book and a Hollywood movie called The Da Vinci Code. Let me tell you something. The Da Vinci Code was just recycled and repackaged Gnosticism. That's all it was. And people were flocking to it. Oh, well, this is the secret knowledge. You know, I, I was so saddened because I have a friend that lives in Ohio that I've known since I was five years old. And I've been trying and trying and trying to witness to him. And I, we mainly communicate by email. And I sent him an email uh, uh, talking to him a little bit about Christ. And you know what he said to me? I don't need that. I read the Da Vinci Code. Here's the Da Vinci Gnosticism, Okay. We talked about this piece of it last week. The Da Vinci Code and other types of Gnosticism will say this, that Jesus wasn't considered to be the Son of God by the early Christians. He was just a good teacher, good man. They liked him a lot. And he was not even considered the Son of God until the year A.D. 325 
when the Roman Emperor Constantine called a thing called the Council of Nicaea and they decided that he was the Son of God. That is baloney. And we know that because we saw last week in Colossians chapter 1 that the early Christian church already had a hymn that they were singing that was about Jesus being God. Amen. Second nonsense coming out of the Da Vinci Gnosticism was that Jesus was actually Mary, married to Mary Magdalene and that she bore his child. Please. You know what I love about that one? You ever see the Da Vinci Code, what they do with the Last Supper? Okay? They say, if you look at the, the Last Supper, which is a beautiful painting, the disciple John is right next to Jesus, which is biblically accurate even though sitting at a table like they are isn't biblically accurate, but that's another whole thing. They laid down when they ate. But, but the guy next to him is John because in the gospel we know that John was able to lay back on Jesus and ask him a question. But in the Da Vinci Code, because John's the youngest, he doesn't have a beard, they say he's Mary Magdalene. Now, there's two problems with that. One, if that's Mary Magdalene, then where was John in the picture? Two, when da Vinci was doing his sketches for the Last Supper, he wrote names over each of the characters. And over that character, just guess what he wrote? John. Not Mary Magdalene. And those who want to push Mary Magdalene will also say this, that Mary Magdalene was actually the leader of the church until those power-hungry men... <laughs> chased her out of her rightful role. Listen, I don't want to knock Mary Magdalene. She was obviously a disciple and, and apparently an important figure. Uh, uh, we don't want to diminish any of the women in the Bible and the roles they had. But by the same token, we want to, we want to base our understanding on what the Bible says. Amen. And that's the other thing. The Da Vinci Code would tell you that the Gospels we have in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, they're not the real ones. They just pick those ones because they like them better. But there's other Gospels out there. And there are. The Gospel of Thomas. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene. The Gospel of Judas. There's all kinds of goofy Gospels out there. The problem is they're false. They're lies. The reason why people like those Gospels is because it matches their theology. But they were written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after Jesus. The books that we're reading, the books that we have in our Bible, were written by people in Jesus' lifetime. Amen. This letter to the Colossian church, Jesus died in, in, in the year 33 AD. Okay, Paul wrote this letter in the 40s. Within 10, 15 years after Jesus died, he talked to people who knew Jesus. He had had an encounter with Jesus. These are the books that represent those who knew Jesus. These later Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas and those, they were written, some of them, in the Middle Ages. Why do people like them better? Because in those Gospels, Jesus isn't the Son of God. Jesus is just a good teacher. And people like good teachers. They just don't want to have a son of God. They don't want to have a Lord over them. And so they're drawn to Gnosticism. And we have to guard ourselves against it. Because we live in a culture where they don't have to come to your town like they did to the Colossians. All you got to do is go on the internet. All you got to do is watch the History Channel. Let me tell you something. I like certain shows on History Channel, but the History Channel is the fountain of Gnosticism. Listen to me. It's garbage. Whenever you see something on the History Channel about the Bible, other than the Bible, that show they did pretty good. But most of the stuff on the History Channel about the Bible is Gnosticism. Be very careful what you watch on that channel. The same strategies that Paul gave the Colossian church are still our best defense. Be in the Spirit. If you're in the spirit, you can discern lies. If you're walking in the flesh, lies sound pretty appealing. So be in the spirit. Two, practice good spiritual discipline. What is, what is good spiritual discipline? One, regular fellowship, regular Bible reading, regular prayer, and have stability in your faith. What does that look like? It means knowing what you believe 
and knowing why you believe it. That's what's called putting into practice what you know. Somebody once said this, part of the Christian life is learning and the other part is living out what we've learned. And that's important because what have we seen already in this letter and the letter to Ephesians? A constant emphasis by the Apostle Paul on what? That's it, Eddie. Walking, walking, walking. Here's what he says in verses 6 and 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, having been built firmly rooted and now built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. If there's a theme that's going to hit us over and over again, we saw it in Ephesians, we're going to see it again in Colossians over and over again, it's to walk, walk, walk that faith out. Ephesians 5.15, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. John 8.12, then Jesus again saying to them, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Later in Colossians, fourth chapter, we'll see this. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. That phrase means unsaved people. Redeeming the time, let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. Romans 6, 4. Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, what? Walk in the newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. 1 Thessalonians 4, 12, that you may walk honestly towards them that are without, once again, unbelievers, and that you may have lack of nothing. And Galatians 5, 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Paul uses two additional analogies as he's encouraging them and encouraging us in how this looks, a healthy Christian walk. The first analogy he uses is a picture of a tree. He says you have to be firmly rooted. Now that sounds contrary to the idea of walking because walking means moving and, and roots mean standing still. But really in the Christian walk, we have to have roots before we can move. And this goes all the way back to Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked nor stand in the path of sinners nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season. And its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. I was thinking about that verse, about that psalm, and, and Paul talking about us being firmly rooted. And I was thinking, man, we have had such evidence in our area recently. In uh, 2012, we had the derecho came through. Okay, I don't know if they had that where you were, Donnie, but it was like a mini tornado swept through the South Jersey area. And then we had Superstorm Sandy that hit in October. And between those two things, I think I've seen more uprooted trees in that year than I probably would ever see in my lifetime. You just see the, you know, the root ball. And what I noticed is this. When those trees would go over, most of the time, I was surprised, I don't know about you, I was surprised that a tree this big around had a root ball this big around. And I said, that's why they went over. Because the roots weren't deep and the roots weren't spread out and the roots weren't strong. And the same thing is true for each one of us. When a storm blows into our lives, whether it's a trial or a tribulation, whether it's false teaching blows into our lives, if we're not rooted, it's going to blow us over. Amen. I don't care what it looks like on the outside. See, your, your Christianity may look okay on the outside, on the surface. You know, you may come to church and people say, how are you doing? I'm blessed, brother. You know, but are your roots deep? See? And those roots only get deep when you spend time with Jesus. 
And whether that's happening or not is up to you. Nobody else can do that for you. And if your roots aren't deep, a storm's going to come into your life and your Christianity is going to go like this. Boom. And people are going to say, what happened to so-and-so? They used to be so strong in their faith. Not as strong as you thought. That's the problem. They looked strong, but they had no roots. And Jesus talks about that in the parable of the sower. He says there are plenty of people out there that are going to sprout up and they're going to look like, whoa, check it out. He's growing like a weed, but he's got no roots. You've got to put your roots down. Paul's telling them this. Look, you've got storms coming your way. You've got false teaching coming your way. Get your roots in. You've you got to know Jesus. You've got to know who you are in Jesus. And the second picture is this picture of a building. He says, now being built up in him and established by your faith. I was thinking about that. Built an establishment. And I thought, you know, there's a difference between a building and an establishment. A building can be empty, but an establishment is a place where things are going on. Right? An empty building is not an establishment. It's just a building. And so I was thinking that's kind of like the difference between the first stage of our spiritual growth, which is being restored, and the second stage, which is being inspired. In the first stage, God's building us up because the world of sin has broken us down. And by the time we come to Christ, we, we're usually in rubble. You saw that tragic thing happen in Philly? The guy knocked down a building and killed some people? Well, well, just go look, Google that picture of that building and say, hey, that was my life. Before Christ, we're just crumbling. We're just a shell. And God comes in and he wants to restore us. He wants to rebuild us. He wants to make us solid again and put us on a good foundation through faith in Christ. But the thing is, God didn't create us to be empty buildings. Once he's restored your life, he has very big intention of moving in. He wants to inspire you. Not just put your life back together so you can say, hey, thanks, I'm good. And go on living the way you were living. You'll end up as a wreck again. No, God says, I want to come and I want to live in you. I want to inspire you. And so he wants to move us from being a building to being an establishment. And in that establishment, he wants to do business. <coughs> what kind of business? Well, Jesus said this. When he was 12 years old, he figured it out. Luke chapter 2, verse 49. His parents found him in a temple. He said, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And that's what God is trying to inspire us to understand. That these restored lives, listen, it's great to have a restored life. It's great to be out of your addiction, to be out of your mess, to have your life back. But don't stand there and be an empty building. Let God come in you and establish in you his business. That's why he restored you, so he can use you for his purposes and his business. And I think that's pretty exciting. And that's why the final thing that Paul says to them, he says not just being firmly rooted and not just being uh, firmly established, but he says you should be overflowing with gratitude. When you, open, when you open for business in the morning, when you get up and you realize I'm rebuilt, by my faith in Jesus Christ and God wants to do business with the world with me today, you should be like a shopkeeper who opens the door and says, hey everybody, come on in. I'm happy to be here doing business today. Amen. We talked about it earlier when we were in worship and I want to close with this song. It talks about why we should be overflowing with gratitude because of what Jesus did for us. Because everything changed because of his blood. and love price of life's demand shameful sin placed on him the hope of every man oh the blood
blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice that saves my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. Save your son, holy one, slain so I can live. See the lamb, the great I am, who takes away my sin. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice that saves my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. Oh, the blood of the Lamb. Oh, the blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb, the precious blood of the Lamb. What a sacrifice that saves my life. Yes, the blood, it is my victory. Oh, what love, no greater love, grace. How can it be that in my sin, yes, even then he shed his blood for me? Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sacrifice! that saved my life yes the blood it is my victory what a sacrifice that saved my life yes the blood it is my victory Father God, we just come before you today. We thank you that that's the victory, the blood of Jesus Christ. There's no secret knowledge. There's no deeper knowledge. There is only the blood of Jesus. There is only how deep do I want to go with the blood of Jesus. Father, we know that we are surrounded by false teaching, just like the Colossians were. Teaching that wants to minimize Jesus, that wants to put him on a shelf somewhere, that wants to make him a casual, once in a while part of our lives. And that's not right. Because Jesus didn't treat us like a casual thing. He poured out his blood completely for us. So Father, I just pray that, that we would take the, the strategies that Paul outlined for the Colossian church and that we would learn to be disciplined in our walk and we would learn to be rooted and we would learn to be an establishment for God saying listen anybody want to know what my business is I'll tell you what my business is well no I'm not saying uh, I'm a carpenter or I'm this or I'm that that's what I do to earn a living what I'm telling you my business is my father's business my business is to show the love of Jesus my business is to proclaim the gospel to a hurting and dying world my business is to walk walk with my Christianity at the forefront of who I am. And Father, let us be those people that you've called us to be. Let us be on guard and have deep roots in who Jesus is so that no matter which side the storm comes from and no matter how strong it is, we stand strong because we know who we are and we walk in who we are. And we thank you for calling us today to be those people through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray, amen.